Okay, so thank you for the for being here in this session that is that has this name of building the Green Deal data space in a way that contributes to geo. We have a very packed agenda, so I already prepared the high technology uh, uh, thing to measure the time, uh, <laughs> and uh, I have a couple of uh, things to say. The first one is that we have an Slido system to actually generate questions. As I say, we have a very packed agenda, so we will try to save the, the questions for the final discussion. And for that reason, I will uh, ask all the presenters to uh, provide uh, their presentation in five minutes or less, never, never more. And I say that to myself also. Uh, so the, if you are an old school, uh, you can go to slido.com and uh, use the number 2004342. This is like one of these TV shows that says the telephone only once and you missed it already. Uh, <laughs> so uh, 2004342, but I believe you can take a picture of that thing in the middle and that will go to that. This is also an activity organized by, by the Action Group for the Green Deal Data Space. If you want to be in our email list, please email myself. This is juan.mazo at uab.cat. So please uh, let us know, or, or to Paolo, and uh, let us know that you want to be part of this uh, group announcement, and we will uh, add you there. And we, I believe with no further delay, we will, we will go for our first uh, presentation. Uh, the title is European Data Ecosystems and Geo. This is Franz Eiler from the European Commission. And uh, the floor is yours. Uh, if we can have the slides for the presentation, that will be better. If not, probably you remember by heart. <laughs> so let's, let's, let's wait for them and see. Okay, thank you, Shoa. Franz Imler. Correct pronunciation, it's not so easy, I guess, um, yeah. from European Commission. I work in the DG for Research and Innovation and lead the team on environmental observation. And we basically much engaged with GEO and EuroGEO. Um, I will, in fact, um, not take a lot of time and just probably reflect a bit on the title of this session, European Data Ecosystem and GEO. Oh, that, sorry, that's the title of my talk. Is it there? Yes? Yeah, yeah that's fine. That's it. That's it. That's, um, so, um, <clears throat> oops, but I think that's not the slide. Okay. There's one slide missing. Okay, sorry. So, um, yeah, as I said, probably I will anyway raise a bit more questions than provide some or raise some thoughts, food for thought. So European, European data spaces is, is something that uh, came out from the European data strategy that was formulated in 2020 by the European Commission. And it's a lot in the context with quite some legislation that also came up as part of this European data strategy the Data Act, the Data Governance Act, uh, and some others that you probably are aware of or not. But in fact, this data um, legislation may well be a game changer in some respects. The way we use data, the way data is, is raised and, and owned and licensed and used by various actors. Um, it's particularly concerns data that comes from IoT, so from devices that you have, from machines, from your car. All these things generate data today, and um, and indeed, it's quite a quite a hot topic to discuss. Uh, who owns it currently? For example, the data that is generated by a machine like your car is owned by the manufacturer of that car and they do with it whatever they like. They have cameras inside your car that <laughs> uh, take pictures of whatever you do in there. 
So be aware. And um, so these things should be a bit better um, governed in the future. That's one of the key aspects. And that has, of course, also some impact in the area of Earth observation, even though here we already are in a space where we have already well established rules and procedures and we follow in GEO, as you know, very much the open data policy. So we want data to be available that comes from Earth observation instruments from space, but also from ground and in various places. Um, so that's a bit this context of data space, but the question is, what is that now a, a data space? And in fact, um, in this case, I cannot really provide you with some answer. What I, I took this slide from um, Patrick's Griffiths presentation from last year's EuroGeo, um, because it kind of shows in bit the area in which we interact. It's quite a, it's quite a fragmented. There's so many different places. We actually have a very um, rich um, area of data creation, data platforms, uh, data. Um, um, high, high performance infrastructure and, and so on. So it's a very rich, but also very fragmented space. And um, part of the idea of having data spaces is to bring some more coherence into this um, and to, to serve the needs of users. And that's a bit the key aspect. So just to give some key aspects that I think could be interesting for the discussion. So we have this uh, rich, but also very fragmented digital EO ecosystem, as we call it today, or a system of systems or systems of ecosystems. But it's, it's definitely not a well coherent uh, and, and well regulated system that we currently look at with a huge number of actors within Europe. And of course, a lot more if you look at the global, um, global scene. Um, I, I really sorry that um, yeah, one slide is missing, but you see here a link to the HRC report that was very recently published. And I think it's really, I just read it thanks to the fact that I come here by train and had, a, had some time to read long documents. Um, and I think it's really worth looking into it because it's very, very well elaborated. And again, it raises, um, raises questions and aspects. It doesn't really provide probably the, the key solution. In fact, it says, that there's no, you will not have a centralized infrastructure governance that is not very realistic in this very fragmented and very diverse space. Um, rather, uh, we should take a community-based approach and design this data space from the user needs. And I think that's a very important aspect. So we cannot create, and I think that was a bit the idea in GEO with building a system of systems, create one big uh, platform system that serves all, all needs. This will never work. But instead we should start from the user needs, from what, what actually do we, what tools do we want to produce? What services do we, do we want to produce? And, re and formulate the requirements, which data do we need? Which uh, data quality do we need? Uh, and so on, Re formulate the requirements from there and then build the data space based on those needs. Um, so you will have, and that's anyway what you see, you will have a, a number of data spaces. There will not be the one data space, but for each area where you need it, you will build the data space according to the user needs. And that's, I think, a very important aspect. Of course, I think it raises questions with the Green Deal data space. Okay, who are the users <laughs> and what are their needs? But this we cannot discuss today. So GEO, as you know, has its new strategy and the term Earth Intelligence is one, one key um, term in this new strategy. And again, it says, I think we can interpret it a bit the same way. So we want to build really user-driven tools, user knowledge, tailored, actionable knowledge or insights that serve the needs of the users. In GEO, of course, this is always related to addressing the big environmental challenges like climate, uh, biodiversity loss, disasters, etc. 
And based on those needs that we identify for a certain group, we build the corresponding data space. So based on requirements, and GEO, I think, offers then a great opportunity. So we can start doing this in Europe, and we have started doing this already quite well in Europe. And GEO offers an opportunity to scale this up on a global scale, um, based also or in cooperation with the GEO initiatives. So that's what I wanted to bring into the discussion. Thanks for listening. And Back to the next speaker or back to the chair. Thanks. Thank you very much for the for the introduction. The next uh, speaker here is uh, Paolo Mazzetti, that uh, from the CNR. He is a great speaker from the Great Project. Ha ha ha! And by the way, if you use the slide, oh, there is a pool, but there is also a Q and A. So you have to click in there instead of being here, and then you can formulate questions. Go ahead, please. Thank you, John. I don't see my slide yet. I'm going to give you a very quick introduction to the great project, which is the project for building the community of practice for the later implementation of the Green Deal data space. Thank you. I see something over my slides, if you can. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so I would start linking back to what Franz just said, that our activity stems from the European strategy for data, which envisions the creation of the common European data space and the single market of data to foster a data-driven economy, already actually citing the Green Deal priorities as one of the main objectives. But what is interesting is that it highlights that it is not just about data sharing, but also about trust, so meaning protection of privacy ethics and so creating the so-called European way to data sharing. And in terms of implementation, there are <clears throat> several actions. Uh, one is in the Digital Europe program for preparatory actions to the uh, implementation of the data space uh, and here is where our project was uh, funded and then in parallel there are activities in the horizon uh, europe uh, program for funding research uh, on uh, and innovation for the green deal data space and here four projects were funded and you we will have uh, uh, some speech uh, later about that but of course uh, we have also many many initiatives and also uh, Franz uh, mentioned, and in particular here you can see mentioned Copernicus, uh, uh, Gaia X, uh, Destination Earth, and of course Eurogeo and the Geo. So the, 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 the objective for uh, the, the implementation of the sectorial data spaces, including the Green Deal one, is to address one of the major uh, challenges, I would say, in Europe that is uh, to reduce the current fragmentation of initiatives and infrastructures, to create this uh, interoperable uh, and uh, reliable uh, trusted, uh, let's say, data, data sharing uh, for uh, sharing of data, but also processing, so usage, and uh, uh, to put in place a set of rules, so not just uh, technical aspects, but also governance aspects. And so the idea is, of course, to create this uh, Green Deal data space and make this, uh, uh, of course, uh, taking into account what is already existing, including the future other sectorial data spaces. So uh, the great project uh, will is uh, started uh, September last year. Sorry, <laughs> I don't know what happened. <laughs> <It's> not... <laughs> But basically, we will hand on February next year, or probably with an extension in April, but we are in the last months. And the first action was to build the community of practice for the Green Deal, you can see here, addressing in particular three of the main, uh, of the many, I would say, uh, policy strategy um, related to the Green Deal that are the uh, zero pollution action, the biodiversity strategy for uh, 2030, and the climate action. And uh, the community of practice uh, includes uh, the, the, the so-called quadruple helix of innovation, so the industry, the academic world, the government, and civil society. And the objective is to collect the requirements for the three 
let's say, uh, major activities in the project that are the definition of the high priority data sets for the Green Deal applications, the definition of an high level architecture, a conceptual model uh, that's called the technical blueprint, and uh, the definition of the government, the governance and the business model. Each of these activities releases one uh, of the major outcomes that actually feed the, 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 the definition of the roadmap to the implementation. We are currently in um, the first round, so uh, we are delivering now the first version of the roadmap, so we already have the first version of the other three activities, and the next, the next month uh, through the consultation of the community, of our community of practice, we will refine uh, the, the, the results. I would uh, just highlight some aspects of relation with, uh, uh, with Eurogeo and Geo. Concerning, for example, the technical aspects, uh, we started uh, with the concept of digital ecosystems, implemented with what is called the soft infra infrastructure, which means uh, basically based on uh, agreements, so standard specifications, and logical building blocks that can help to, to, to create the data space. We actually uh, had some lessons learned from activities, for example, in GEO. Some example is, for example, the, the, the use, the combination, I would say, of community standards with mediation uh, tools. And uh, uh, also, uh, the, the, this architecture is, uh, includes interoperability, but not only interoperability. What is interesting is that there is this trust aspect, which means that we have also a security and trust architecture, which is actually developed also in coordination with the other data spaces. Uh, there are European initiatives uh, that are part of the design. For example, we have research infrastructure as part of the, 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 the consortium, the EPOS. We have um, uh, interaction with the community infrastructure like EMODNET and more generally the, the marine community. Um, we have GeoFlagship, for example, goes for m uh, the, 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 the observatory on Mercury. And uh, uh, of course, uh, uh, relation with the Copernicus services, Destination Earth, and so on. There are also, uh, say, similarities, but also differences in the data space creation and in uh, geo and geo objectives. For example, the data space has this focus not just on data sharing, but also on trust. Uh, while, as also Franz mentioned before, the focus uh, of the geo is now clearly on this uh, idea of earth intelligence, that's generation of knowledge. Uh, the Green Deal data space, like all the other data spaces, has already, since the beginning, a focus on governance. And uh, uh, also in terms of objectives, of course, uh, the Green Deal data space is focused on European Green Deal objectives while uh, uh, the focus of GEO is on engagement priorities, but of course uh, there is uh, also an overlap on these uh, uh, priorities. And this is uh, my last slide. Thank you. And now it's my turn to actually introduce uh, Joan Mazot from CREAF, presenting some activities on the AD4GD project, correct? Yes. So thank you, I'm not longer the moderator, I'm the speaker now. So as soon as I have the slides in the screen, I will tell you about this AD4TD. So the great project is a coordinated support action on, on, data, on the Green Deal data space. The AD4TD, the FerryCube, the Usage, and the BC are three research projects that are bringing ideas on how to uh, develop the Green Deal data space. I work at uh, this CREAF center there in, in Barcelona. So these spaces were uh, presented. Priorities of the European Green Deal is the climate change, the circular economy, the pollution, the biodiversity, and the deforestation that makes the Green Deal data space the most heterogeneous and multidisciplinary of all, I believe. And uh, we have been uh, thinking if the data space is the only and the right solution to ensure open data and at the same time trust governments and data sovereignty. I'm saying that because the industry defines the data space, and I'm talking about the International Data Space Association, as, as a mechanism to distribute static assets 
shared among two participants in a secure channel. So uh, this means that uh, you need some kind of a software that is called connector. And the data sharing that they are uh, using as a concept is exactly the opposite as open data, because it's two partners deciding in a contract to actually exchange data in exchange of service, money, whatever. So actually, we are not talking about the data sharing principles uh, that are in GEOS, but these other semantics. And this has been bothering me for a while. Uh, so questions on how to combine open data with secure data in a data space that is based on this definition is a challenge. How to share queryable dynamic assets in a data space is another. Uh, is the data space defined pro 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 to allow processing of data? And uh, is this loosely coupled approach that we all like in GEO uh, providing enough trust uh, in this common definition of the data space? The title of the slide is extending the definition because if we do not extend the definition, then we are lost. So one thing uh, that we can propose is to actually have nodes that are somehow secured, allowing the exchange of information and allowing this digital economy that uh, the Commission wants, but also have open nodes that are uh, not uh, strictly part of the data space in the sense that they are not connectors in the data space, but still they are nodes in the in the data space and try this as a major match. This is not the approach recommended in that uh, book, uh, chapter uh, 14, but uh, after thinking about this, uh, this, is, this is the conclusion that we got in the, the project that the approach that I presented to you might be better. And also, of course, we need to uh, add the geospatial services that the International Data Space Association doesn't know about. Uh, so we, in our project, want to break silos in the Green Deal data space. And uh, we will do several things. Those are just examples. Uh, we want to share and combine in situ data using the sensor thing API and this new extension of sensor thing that is called sensor thing API plus. And I'm victim about uh, one minute. Uh, and also with uh, gridded data in data cubes. We are going to do the first with usage. We are going to do the second with vcube and ferric uh, cube. So we are collaborating among us, trying to figure out the right uh, recommendations for the Green Deal data space. We want to use semantics and we have two approach, one general data uh, information model for the Green Deal and another focus more on detecting variables and observe properties, their names, if they are essential variables, units of measures, and of course reports on provenance uh, of the data. This is the way we can build uh, trust uh, and uh, sovereignty in uh, an open environment. And of course, that other thing about the uh, OGC services I already told you. We have three uh, use cases that are at the bottom of uh, the screen. This uh, thing is, is actually presenting uh, how we interpret the FAIR principles in general. Uh, I will just not repeat that because it's more or less the same that I showed to you. We have a pilot in Berlin about water, water quality, water availability. We have another pilot in Catalonia about biodiversity and actually connectivity of mammals in the metropolitan area. And we have an air quality case on or, uh, North Italy on trying to complement uh, official uh, products, uh, reference data and so on with uh, sensor data, uh, chip sensors, citizen science data, and so on. And uh, we have uh, we are promoting this special issue on data spaces that uh, we are the guest editors. We are inviting all of you to actually present your research in there or your discussions. Uh, as mm, one of the promoters of the action group, I would like to emphasize that we have this web page about the action group, action group .green deal data space. And uh, of course, I'm not doing this alone. There are some partners. Uh, apart from CREAF in the All Data for Green Deal. And I will shut up immediately. Please follow us. Thank you, John. So my next speaker is Peter Bauman from Jacobs University, talking about the Earth Server Data Space Analysis Ready A-Cubes for the Green Deal. Please, Peter. 
Thank you very much for the kind introduction. So let me have a look. Is that a slide I can tell something about? Yeah, this looks good. Okay. So thanks for having me here in this exciting discussion that is about Green Deal and how we want to deal with the deal. A lot of good things have been said with more wisdom than I can present on this topic here. Therefore, let me just focus on one thing. I believe one key question is that we can really quantitatively assess changes and forecasts, etc. And actually, as we talk about quantities, this is a typical classical big data problem that we have, and we need to get somehow order into that. In particular, and Joan has mentioned that too, as we have not one, but several such data spaces and they overlap, they share data, which complicates it even more. So bottom line, we have a problem, get into groups with our data, a big data problem. Now, uh, the keyword data cubes also has been mentioned already. Uh, this is no magic, it's just a simple way to perceive data. If you and I talk about the atmosphere in this room here, do we talk about dozens of net CDF files? Rather, we talk about three dimensions, X, Y, Z, and in time, we have something four dimensional. So the spatial temporal view on the data that are spatial temporal is the data cube principle. And that simply makes it easier, makes it easier not only for humans, by the way, but also for tools. Okay, this doesn't come by itself. It needs some work to getting everything together, homogenizing, and in the end, making that analysis ready. We always had to do that. But that was done by the users, scientists, whoever, who had to download data, homogenize, extract, bring them together. And that is one of the major hurdles. Today, however, this is more and more pushed to the service providers. They should do that job once and for all. Uh, they know the data best and they have the resources for it. And then we have an easier way that works across dimensions, ideally, uh, to provide data in a way to make them more understandable. Uh, what we have done in that uh, field is actually at some time, uh, we have initiated, we have uh, coined data cubes uh, that is documented by publications, et cetera. Uh, we follow a data cube, a database approach to that, in that we want to offer management and analytics like any database system, just not on tables, but on data cubes. So that is uh, done uh, over many research projects. And today, this is a full stack implementation that is operational on um, over 160 petabytes. And it has found, by the way, the blessing of SQL. Yes, the query language for data cubes uh, that we have developed is part of the SQL standard today. OK, the practical use of that is actually in something that you can call a data space, that is Earth server. This is really not something that has been designed up high in governments or so, but it's a grassroots movement of data centers where everybody brings in individual data and they come together forming a big pool, a single pool of location transparent data access, um, which is fully based on open standards and allows analytics with zero coding. You find data centers from the US over Europe uh, to Taiwan. Uh, it's open, free, transparent, and democratic. And it also combines both free and commercial data. And as has been said, yes, they need to have some minimum of trust. And there need to be mechanisms to establish, to implement that, so that this trust can be verified every time, let us say, a new administrator comes in. And we want to retain local autonomy in the end. Uh, as an outlook, we can then think about how to add in a further spice, like, for example, AI. And our approach is uh, in co collaboration with the FerryCube project and AIcube, Begun Demir in TU Berlin, uh, to add that into the query language so that users get a seamless view on the data, on the processing, be that classical processing or machine learning. Uh, that all is available via standards-based client, lots of third-party clients. And actually, uh, there are so many colors in this picture, so this is just a good point to stop here. Thank you very much, very much for your attention. And I give back to the moderator. Thank you, Peter. Uh, next speaker is uh, Stefania Murrone from Epsilon Italia presenting the FairyCube project. Please, Stefania.
the floor is yours. Thank you, thank you, Paolo. Um, okay, waiting for the slides. Uh, in the meantime, I'm Stefania Morrone, working for Epsilon Italia in the context of the FerryCube project. Um, just, uh, okay, here. Um, a little background, so how does our project originate? Uh, discussions we're having with uh, our um, non-Earth observation colleagues on what they could do if only they could uh, add their fine-grained in situ observation data with the wealth of um, Earth observation products. So um, they would like to have uh, uh, an easy overview of what data is available uh, and necessary storage requirements. Um, they wanted to understand how to merge the different grids, how to understand machine learning techniques, or uh, where to find description and algorithms that maybe they can uh, easily reapply and under what condition, how they could estimate uh, processing resources required for data analysis, and how they could integrate existing point and vector data. So they were just like child in front of a candy store, not finding a way uh, past the glass pane. So um, while talking, uh, about how to deliver the power of data cubes and machine learning to decision makers and data scientists, uh, merging the special temporal dimension to uh, the thematic dimension. Uh, they, they wanted just to find some de their data, so wanted data to be findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable Earth observation data. And clearly, when we talk about um, observation data, Earth observation data, we are talking about data cubes. And the idea was to uh, find a way to go from collection of existing tools and services to an integrated platform that the user can um, access uh, through a data catalog of pre-gridded, pre-aligned, and pre-referenced Earth observation data. Uh, a data process, uh, uh, processing catalog that includes also analysis and processing resources and machine learning, uh, and that could help with data storage and computation of needed resources, uh, with possibility to create own custom data cube, uh, and metadata uh, pipeline, so data, the processing steps, and so on, and community platform sharing. So this is how the idea originated. Uh, this has become a proposal uh, uh, that was accepted uh, by the Horizon Europe project. Um, and this became, uh, FerryCube became an Horizon Europe project that will end in 2025. A consortium co uh, considers uh, three research institutes and also uh, SMEs in the environmental and geomatic field and technical SMEs. Um, so mission of our uh, project, uh, enable players from beyond classic Earth observation domain to provide access, process, and share gridded data and algorithms in a fair and trustable manner, and create a common marketplace for data, algorithms, and machine learning models. Uh, how to do this? We want to establish a Fairy Cube Hub that is an integrated platform for fair special earth observation data ingestion, analysis, and machine learning processing. Uh, this uh, demonstrates the Fairy Cube Hub by running five use cases addressing EU Green Deal actions, so climate change, circular economy, and biodiversity, but even more, and collaborate with major communities working on data cubes, like the EuroData Cube, uh, Earth Server, extend the um, usability and visibility, the findability of Earth observation data through an integrated platform, so in the same place, and provide insight to the creation of the Green Deal data space. So we have uh, five use cases with urban and regional focus. Um, you will find more information downloading the presentation. I don't want to run out of time. Uh, so um, we are using the data cubes clearly, but uh, what is the particularity of, the, of our project? In, in our case, we need both uh, the uh, spatial temporal dimension of the cubes and the thematic dimension of the cubes. So um, we are building on standards. 
and the ISO 19123 uh, is the adjusted standard, and uh, I will not go into the details, but uh, we focus on uh, uh, multidimensional uh, gridded coverages and uh, support grid topologies whose axes are aligned with the axis of the uh, CRS. And we want that axis can be referenceable. That uh, is, for example, the axis represents category in a code list, or maybe land cover category uh, or species. Um, we are, um, for example, the Rastaman, you have already seen presentation just before mine, uh, support these ISO 19123 specifications. We realized occurrence cubes, uh, genomic cubes, and land cover alternative cubes. Uh, nice is that there we have thematic access, and uh, we provide in single pixel not only which is the uh, overall land cover assignment, but we can provide uh, percentages in the pixel because we have. Have the, the cube and these are axes of the cube but for this please ask question may, maybe later so cross domain issues we are facing uh first of all crs's uh, domain and machine learning experts usually are unaware of uh, crs issues they only think about google coordinate or um, wgs 84 and uh, the, the main access how uh, do we uh, effectively integrate domain dimension and with spatial temporal dimensions, um, and also uh, which are requirements for understandable artificial intelligence when supporting scientific uh, research. Uh, also, how much data storage and processes we need. This is important, but last one. So the metadata concept. So uh, metadata is essential. Uh, exposing good information about quality, about how you can apply and when it is possible and is feasible to apply um, uh, what you will find in the, the metadata catalog, for example, an algorithm, uh, to what data. So um, there is no, currently uh, no much support for this, for example, for data set uh, in the metadata standard, there is not much support for analysis ready data and for analysis and processing resources. We are extending the, stand, uh, the stack standard uh, um, and, and then the work we will find in the uh, FerryCube GitHub uh, um, repositories. So also outline different grids uh, because some are geodetic, some are projected, understanding different grid approaches. So how to assign values to, but I'm, I'm stopping uh, in a few seconds. Different types of data require different resampling approach. Uh, this is very important. Uh, and which is our contribution to the green deal data space? What would we like to do? Standardizing data models supporting uh, uh, ARD, so utilizing the standards and including comprehensive metadata, extended in uh, a grid way, uh, public uh, uh, discussion on these and uh, shareable results, uh, dynamic access to data and processing by APIs, so subsetting, so uh, that the user can be, for example, able to ask for subsurface temperature with a specific resolution and a specific CRS. Uh, WCPS uh, queries and user defined functions. So, for example, I want to calculate vegetation index out of land cover, elevation, and auto imagery uh, layers in the cube. Um, support resource estimation and a knowledge base providing support to uh, the diverse approaches. So, um, conclusion is that last slide current geospatial data cubes over focus on spatial temporal dimensions. Uh, and we want that thematic aspects is, is uh, taken into account. For well-founded research, uh, we require both spatial temporal and thematic dimension. Uh, standardization of data model and analysis processing routines enable efficient utilization of these resources. And information on potential pitfalls when applying machine learning to geospatial data cubes, uh, making also this information available. So not only our success, but our feral as well. Thank you very much. Thank you, Stefania. Next presentation is uh, uh, by Quentin Groom from Maize Botanic Garden on simplifying access to biodiversity data for rapid repeatable analysis across large areas in the B-Cube project. Please.
Hello everyone. Yes, I'm Quentin Groom, Mother Botanic Garden, coordinator of uh, building blocks for biodiversity. Um, so what are the challenges we are trying to address? Uh, we recognize the uh, triple crises we're in, but particularly the biodiversity crisis, and we need rapid, reliable, and repeatable uh, workflows to generate information on this for policymaking. We think there is an issue with data, but we think we have enough, and we think we have the right statistical and data analysis tools to be able to analyze data in a useful way. And B Cubed is trying to create workflows to be able to analyze those data in a way that anybody can use those workflows, whether you're from Europe or not, um, and do it in a repeatable way and have those, that code to do it in a way that you can adapt to your own needs. So biodiversity data, as you probably know, comes from all different sorts of sources. It's never the same twice. Um, there's a lot of data coming from citizen science, for instance, such as bird watchers. Uh, we have data coming from eDNA. Increasingly, artificial intelligence is used along with cameras to detect organisms, and even uh, uh, drones can collect data. And all that data, if you want to look at things in a, a broad expanse, has to be aggregated and uh, put together, and we're doing that by using data cubes. So these cubes are, are dimensions of time, space, and taxonomy. So in actual fact, four dimensions. And out of that, we want to create maps and models, indicators uh, for change, uh, and potentially uh, species distribution, uh, species networks, so that we can look at, at uh, ecosystems and how they function. So I won't go into all of this, but obviously Big Cube is very policy aligned. It's funded by a governance call from Horizon Europe, and we are doing that policy alignment. Um, and I've already mentioned uh, about the workflows, but I should say something about the fact we're using cloud computing because that's a very collaborative uh, computing environment, but also one that's extensible and, and can expand as need be. So uh, what are we actually doing? Uh, once we've created the cube, which we're only six months in, but we are already creating cubes. And if anybody wants a cube, please go and ask me afterwards. Um, and uh, we're gonna be doing modeling on those, uh, fairly standard species distribution modeling, but also some more in-depth modeling to pull out information. We're creating indicators on that, such as phylogenetic indicators to look at uh, um, species richness, uh, impacts of invasive species, and their distribution in space, and looking at the robustness of the, all those indicators we produce uh, to inform policy better. Our activities, um, I mentioned the fact we're looking at uh, policy. Uh, that's currently what we're, we're really focusing on at the moment, but we're not just looking at European policy. We're also looking at the broader scale uh, at uh, international policy, particularly the targets of the CBD and the Global Biodiversity Framework, uh, which is very much in the news at the moment, and how BQ can potentially support those initiatives. Um, it occurred to me after hearing lots of these talks how much we talk about interoperability, but I haven't heard anybody talking about training. And when you consider how complicated all of this is, um, training is essential. And I know if we want people to adopt all of the thing, wonderful things we're creating, we need to better train people and train people across disciplines to use um, all of these products. I won't go into any great depth of this because I don't really have enough time, but I wanted to mention the hackathon that we're having uh, next April. So if you don't know what a hackathon is, it's about getting informaticians together, in this case, biodiversity informaticians, getting them talking to the people who want tools, having a week where they can uh, lock themselves in a room as a group and come up with a solution. Um, maybe something they don't have time to do in their daily work, maybe something uh, they can do collaboratively for you people who are not coders. Um, so I, this is a call for you to come to Belgium, to Brussels, uh, to the Hermann Turling building, um, where uh, on the 2nd of, to the 5th of April, we'll be having a hackathon. And uh, yeah, please do come and collaborate whether you're an informatician or not. I should mention my consortium. Uh, there are 13 of us. Uh, two from South Africa and one from Australia, so not all European, uh, but a broad spread of European institutions as well. Uh, and I should also mention particularly uh, GBIF, because that's a global uh, infrastructure and a very important one for biodiversity data. So that's all I have to say. Uh, yeah, please do come and collaborate with us.
Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next speaker is uh, Tom Hengel from Open Geo Hub, speaking on the Open Earth Monitor data processing for the Green Deal data space. So yes, I'm uh, I'm a project lead at the Open Earth Monitor project, and of course we also um, building data cubes um, at different tiers. So we'll talk about it. And uh, let's see. This project is uh, 22 uh, participants, uh, partners. And uh, we started with, we're now about a bit longer than one year. Um, and by the end of this year, there will be quite some outputs coming out. Um, we are quite also a use case driven, use case in the center. And um, on the bottom is the tools uh, we're developing and we have this uh, series of monitors we're going to build, uh, but we published the implementation plan. So if you're really interested, uh, the one on the right here, uh, it's a medium. So we published the implementation plan so you can read it, but it's not too technical. It's more like human readable, but it provides all the details of the things we're going to build. So, um, and of course we have this uh, workshop from Wednesday I think many of you are staying, so you will see everything about uh, what we do um, from uh, Wednesday till Friday. Uh, it's about 110 participants. We were very excited. Um, we decided in implementation plan, it was a very good process to uh, uh, build that implementation plan. And we decided to do a, a three-tier approach. So we are building a central app uh, called uh, Open Node Monitor App. Uh, but we also support the tier two, which is the uh, partners building their own monitors. And the tier three is something that a student or anyone can build in a day or in the afternoon. Um, and I'm equally, equally passionately supporting all three. And they're all really fun, um, but they're very different. You know, if you want to build a tool for somebody to make something in one day or in a few hours, or if you want to make something like a tier one or a professional central place uh, with all the uh, things. Uh, we are use case driven. We have 32 uh, use cases. Uh, this is one of the bigger use cases. Um, it's a global, and we are working with the UNCCD. And just to give you some example how it looks like. So the first thing is uh, we have uh, Baron Orr from um, uh, LDN, UNCCD. I think he's one of the um, founders of this method. And um, so he's also in our stakeholder committee. So we really work close with all these people. You see here, that some of them are here with us also, like Gilberto and Peter Strobel. Um, but we really work for them because we want to really make something that uh, Baron Oro will say, yeah, this is exactly what we need uh, for the LDN. Uh, for example, now they're migrating from uh, 300 meter resolution. They want to migrate to 30 meter resolution global data sets. And there's a couple of global data sets. Um, and we want to help prepare this data so it becomes way more easy to use and way more accessible. And also we want to develop some new, new objective methods to do things. So here's an example, we're just finishing this uh, work on mapping a potential vegetation. Uh, this is the FAPR monthly for one year 2020. Just an example, just to see. Um, so this is the what we call a Earth Without People um, so it's not that, uh, uh, you know, it's not that I'm, uh, I don't like people or something, but, you know, if you want to estimate what is the land potential, you have to imagine how the nature will develop, you know, without human influence, uh, urbanization, uh, intensive uh, crop plants, etc. Uh, and then we also uh, make that difference between potential and actual, and you can see places where it's red. It's something that maybe should worry us because we are under potential. We are worse than nature, let's say. And, but there's also many places we see it's blue, so it's above, it's above potential. And this is the trend map, so you can see negative, positive, negative trends. This is just purely uh, the trends through time for the 23 years. Uh, so we can map these areas, and you can see that in tropics, there's quite some red areas. Um, so that's a bit something worrying, and so something you see in data. Anyway, this all this there's a paper coming up, so you can read about that. I will talk about it also uh, during my session on the open land map. 
but uh, there is a whole publication on that. Um, then we have the Lancet data also. Um, we just got the copy of the whole Lancet at OpenGeoHub. Uh, it's about 1.3 petabyte, and uh, we are now processing it. It's not something you eat for breakfast, of course, um, but we figure out to use the CVDFS and to organize this data. So it's um, we we have the all the reading, writing, and processing is fully parallelized, and it's all running on steroids. So in three weeks, we can crunch the whole world now, Landsat. So that's quite exciting. One of the partners is also making OpenEO. Um, there's quite some people working on OpenEO and developing inside the OpenEO cloud. And there's another example where this is this idea that we can potentially make a, a bit more open source uh, Google Earth engine. So it is kind of similar concept, you know, you put the code and and you develop, uh, you develop in this code, you develop some processing and it all runs on the open your cloud and it's portable, you can document it, uh, you can create a viewer, you can create an app. So, uh, and that's one of the examples, again, I say uh, one of our partners, the Synergy, uh, build this uh, AI for boundaries, um, which is built on, which builds on your crops. So that's it for me, uh, open it monitor. Uh, enjoy the conference and uh, for those of you that are coming for the second part of the week, uh, we look forward to interacting with you. And there is also a data, uh, green deal data space uh, session in uh, the second part of the week, I believe it's on Thursday. So you are all invited to stay there too. We are going to go to the use cases uh, now, some presentation of the use cases. Enrico Boldrini will present us about the WMO use case. Uh, and this is a virtual presentation. The speaker is ready. Yeah, good. And he's going to work. Excellent. Go ahead, please. Thank you, Hon. I'm Enrico Boldrini, working at National Research Council of Italy. I'm presenting the WMO Hydrological Observing System, where CNR is involved as a technical partner, collaborating with the World Meteorological Organization. Washington Otieno, working as a WMO scientific officer and whose coordinator unfortunately couldn't attend today due to an unexpected event. The um, who's the WMO Hydrological Observing System is dedicated to enhancing the sharing of essential uh, hydrological data and achieving uh, seamless interoperability of services and tools. Maybe I... Okay. Its primary goal is to support hydrological needs at local, regional, and global scales. This includes uh, the execution of forecast models and the calculation of indicators uh, that are needed by global initiatives, such as uh, early warning for all, the SDG, clean water and sanitation, for example. The WHOS operates in close synergy with other WMO programs, for instance, it collaborates closely with the WICOS framework program, which focuses on building and strengthening the technical and human capabilities of national hydrological services. This empowers them to efficiently acquire, collect, and finally publish their data online, thereby contributing to the broader goals uh, of us. Who's indeed leverage uh, the data publication systems provided by the multiple organizations here shown on the left side of the diagram. Uh, thanks to the Who's DAB brokering framework, data is then harmonized and can flow from the providers to the different tools shown on the right in order to satisfy user needs. Uh, who uh, supports and uh, contributes to various initiatives, uh, including uh, WIS, the overarching information system being built by WMO to share Earth observations acquired by different 
thematic communities such as meteorology, hydrology, cryosphere, and climate. Additionally, HUS is currently engaged in discussions with the GEO to become a GEO's data provider. This transition should be technically straightforward as both HUS and GEO's rely on the same brokering framework technology, the DAB. However, data policy considerations are as well going to be uh, carefully considered before proceeding. HUS is built on two essential pillars. First one is the promotion and utilization of uh, internationally recognized standards by both data providers and consumers. Examples include WaterML2, WIGOS metadata standard. The second pillar is the adoption of a brokering approach to realize uh, uh, an optimized system of systems in whose each participant is free to publish or utilize data according to the available standards. The choice is dictated by each organization needs, capacities, and the local directives. A third party component, the broker, powered by the DAP technology developed by CNR, takes care of harmonization and mediation. It provides distributed discovery, access, and semantic discovery by leveraging the community maintained HUS ontology. Several use cases have already benefited from HUS, including Arctic River, specific river basins such as Sava or La Plata, Dominican Republic, uh, among others. Currently, 20 data providers actively contribute to HUS. The HUS Global Portal, here shown on the right, based on the Water Data Explorer technology, offers a, a comprehensive overview of these providers and their data. One minute. During the HUS implementation, we encountered various uh, targets uh, and challenges. This include expanding outreach to different communities and participants uh, to enable also multidisciplinary applications improving visibility of participants, enhancing data sharing performance, for example, through the use of caches, collaboratively managing the whose hydrontology, improving data quality, uh, shared hydro data, and uh, manage different organizational policies. Please find the whose contact email here and official site for those interested in learning more through the online documentation and available publications. You can also try out the Who's portals and getting in touch. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we have here you five. Uh, so thank you for bringing that presentation being uh, abroad. Uh, and now we have uh, Sergio Cinderella from the CNR that is going to talk about the Mercury but that is not the planet, I believe. That's the Pluton, uh, the Mercury observation use case. Thank you, Joe. You're right. We are not talking about uh, the planet, but uh, the element Mercury. So I am uh, uh, part of the working group uh, that is implementing uh, the uh, flagship uh, uh, Global Observing Mercury uh, for, for Global Observing System for, uh, for Mercury, uh, which leading uh, scientist is Nicola Pirrone. So, in a nutshell, for those of you that are not familiar with, uh, with this, this flagship, uh, the goose for m is uh, aimed to support the UN Global Partnership on Mercury Fat and Transport. Uh, it uh, is providing a global data set for comparable monitoring data. Uh, is providing a knowledge hub uh, for integrating uh, Earth observation data sets and modeling tools uh, is uh, helping uh, to assess the effectiveness uh, measurement undertaken by the Minamata Convention on, on Mercury. Uh, uh, currently, we have uh, uh, 21 uh, voluntary membership. Uh, a, a governing, uh, uh, governing bodies have been established so the activity is well advanced. Uh, one of the major aim of the uh, flagship is to build uh, the uh, Goose4M Knowledge Hub. Uh, what is this uh, Knowledge Hub? 
It is a multimodal, multi-domain computational platform uh, that, as I said, is aimed to support the effectiveness evaluation of the convention. Uh, it is based on a chemical transport model emulator because, uh, uh, as uh, uh, some of you know, uh, run chemical transport model is a heavy uh, activity which requires a long time. So we provide uh, an emulator of this uh, uh, result. Uh, it shares um, in situ data, uh, model output, uh, and of course, uh, API of uh, services. Uh, it enables uh, scenario analysis uh, for the effectiveness evaluation of policies. Uh, actually, it also provides um, cost estimate. This is a, a, a new uh, section. Uh, for, uh, so cost estimate for uh, uh, to evaluate uh, reduction strategies. But we are also working uh, on the module uh, on human health risk assessment. On the um, right side, you can see the different uh, uh, tools uh, that are integrated in the GUS forum that uh, can be browsed at the address uh, on the top. Uh, 100, more than 100 data set uh, ranging from uh, in situ observation uh, of uh, atmosphere, mercury uh, measurement in atmosphere, the, uh, oceanic campaigns, atmospheric campaign, but also uh, not reported here, uh, measurement in biota, because uh, one, the problem of mercury in the environment is the problem of uh, uh, biota, is the end point of mercury biota. And at the end, uh, human health, the, the impact on human health is uh, um, uh, fish food. So we provide also services. Uh, everything can be browsed through uh, our own catalog, but also uh, through the uh, Geo Community Portal. Uh, everything is uh, uh, interoperable. We use uh, uh, ISO uh, metadata. Uh, we support uh, the implementation of the um, Geo Knowledge Hub, um, in which uh, data are, um, are uh, quality assured and quality controlled against um, standard operating procedures. Uh, all modules, each modules of the Knowledge Hub is peer reviewed because each module has uh, behind uh, publish uh, publication. So uh, the workflow is clear. Uh, the uh, chemical transport model emulator has API that uh, are open source, and uh, the license for the for uh, for this uh, uh, for the use of the of data set is uh, under preparation. So the last two slide, why we are inside grid as a use case. Uh, this is my perspective, of course. We have to work uh, in the follow uh, in the follow months, but goose for uh, is knowledge provider uh, that can serve different communities uh, of practice. The first community is, of course, the, the scientist uh, composed by scientists, but the other one is uh, uh, the policy community because we are interacting uh, with the uh, UN environment uh, and the GUS4M uh, is, uh, uh, is uh, reported in the official document of the, uh, of the COP, of the Conference of Party of the Minamata Convention. Uh, so we have a long co-design experience because each module come out from uh, an answer to policy question. Uh, it is ready to be part of a digital ecosystem uh, because we have metadata and data data compliant. Uh, they are at the first level of uh, interoperability, more or less second, but uh, are, can be uh, are available uh, as an exchange format uh, well uh, well known. Uh, 
the technical uh, architecture of uh, for data uh, and services is based on open source component so it requires medium skills uh, also for deployment his federation its federation uh, we are talking about federation of uh, uh, not data but entities uh, is voluntary uh, and uh, we are we have developed uh, um, we have developed the module based on policy uh, question uh, two, uh, three last point uh, gosforem is partner of uh, um, is part of the irene research infrastructure uh, implementation project uh, irene ppp which is aimed to um, implement the esri uh, infrastructure on the uh, development of uh, advanced technologies, complementary services uh, on the characterization of uh, uh, the environmental exposure. Uh, it will take the opportunity to demonstrate uh, through pilots the generation of, of knowledge. Uh, and uh, uh, last week, it will take advantage from uh, the uh, uh, IE uh, workbench of the uh, Green Deal data space. So I'm available for any question. Uh, thank you. Thank you, George. Uh, we did hydrology, uh, we did mercury, now we go for climate. Uh, or is this? Uh, the climate change, I uh, I feel powers pursuing Green Deal goals and potentially enriching the Green Deal data space. Yes. Hello, everyone. I'll be discussing the IFAN project, a classic, let's say, uh, horizon project, the research and innovation action. We are... Uh, We are two uh, thirds of the way there. Uh, okay, so this is a basic structure. It has two components. One, we are using the GEOS portal to get data to build pilots on the mostly on climate change adaptation and the uh, second on a bit less on mitigation. Uh, the second component is that we want to give back to the GEOS portal, hopefully by improving its set capacities augmenting metadata, and uh, so on. Why the IFER project is a Green Deal project? We have uh, five pilots. We have uh, water and land use management in Holland, uh, in the Netherlands. Uh, this directly links with the individual actions underneath the Green Deal uh, policy. So it's farm to fork, it's biodiversity through uh, nature-based solutions regarding climate adaptation and soil organic carbon. We have a pilot on sustainable agriculture in Lithuania. So again, a farm to fork and climate neutrality through uh, soil organic uh, carbon modeling and uh, looking at individual uh, different agricultural practices at the parcel level. Uh, we have a pilot on um, maritime transport, uh, cruise ships in the Balearic Islands, and we are uh, looking for a more environmentally friendly uh, transport blue economy, zero pollution, because we are using Copernicus and AI to create a, a management um, tool uh, with respect to cruise ship pollution. We have a pilot on sustainable urban development. So again, a lot of Green Deal action points, renovation of wave, building energy efficiency, renewable energy, rooftop, uh, rooftop photovoltaics, uh, environmentally friendly transport, introducing electric vehicles, and understanding the greenhouse gas footprint. And we bind all this together with a zero pollution uh, application, uh, state-of-the-art intra-urban chemical transport uh, modeling. Uh, and the last pilot is a multi-hazard risk assessment in the forest of Finland. We are looking uh, uh, to get together at fire and uh, pest risk. So this links to the biodiversity strategy of the Green Deal. However, we are, okay, we are a research project, but we are not a Green Deal project per se. There are some official Green Deal projects. They even have their own portal from where, where you can see this image. This was the last horizon call, the big one billion call to give an initial boost to the Green Deal. Okay, so Enters Eiffel is one of 64, uh, of 64 more uh, projects like Harmonia we will be hearing next. 
Uh, what about these uh, projects? As you saw in the previous slide, we are de facto uh, contributors to the Green Deal. So what about these projects? How can they get linked with the Green Deal data space? And of course, hundreds more uh, are sitting in the Cordis database to be and are waiting somehow to be linked. We are a geo project by design. This was a very, uh, it was a very explicit call, uh, a geos call, let's put it like this. And Eiffel responded again exp explicitly. Our pilots are mostly based on geos uh, slash Copernicus data. Uh, when not, we try to offer an explanation why we had to use a commercial DSM, for example. Uh, we will be feeding the geo knowledge package at least three knowledge packages we will be providing. So perhaps this is a nice way to connect with the Green Deal, to kill two birds with one stone, uh, uh, so to speak. And uh, I will discuss about the GEOS portal uh, search capacity next. And uh, quite importantly, we are also bringing more partners closer to GEO. Uh, literally, uh, science partners did not know of GEO. So this is a good thing and something to have in, in mind uh, as a whole. Uh, regarding the search capacity, we have built a cognitive search engine. This is quite a, a mouthful. It is based on language model uh, technology. And uh, what happens is a, a user, uh, a potential user, enters a natural language query. And this is translated into a vector, an embedding, and uh, the, the database finds the, the closest uh, vectors and brings back brings back a hierarchy of results. How we train this, we refine this uh, model. Uh, the IT partners ask us, the science partners, the geo partners, to provide a body of, uh, for training. So we did this, we send papers, we send publications, we send uh, links, keywords, uh, whatever. And they created a very nice corpus of 300 million words on something like this. So perhaps this is a good idea because whatever the space, data space, before we had digital twins and data lakes, you have to find stuff when you don't know what you are looking for exactly. So perhaps this language model uh, cognitive search thing could be uh, replicated uh, in these directions. We are collaborating with the Geos Platform Plus project, hopefully fusing the current uh, findability uh, of uh, Geos Portal together with ours. And last slide, uh, last year, high value data sets were a big thing in EuroGeo. We strongly advocate for their uh, uh, usefulness, their value. Here is just an application regarding building uh, uh, energy efficiency. You have three basic outputs, energy consumption, CO2 equivalent emissions, and, and uh, building performance at building block level. To do this, we had three tiers uh, approach. One from starting from Copernicus, completely open data, urban atlas, etc., up to uh, the reference data coming from statistics Greece. Uh, and uh, these uh, data are really valuable and we should take care to introduce them properly into the Green Deal data space because it took us literally one year to get hold of this data. Imagine if we had it one year before, what we could have uh, made out of this. Thank you for your attention. And uh, now uh, we will have uh, Stefano Natali that will tell us about the uh, EU, sorry, the EO for EU uh, use case. Are you here? Yes. yes. Give us the slides. Hello, everyone. I'm Stefano Natali from uh, Sistema. I will run the presentation together with my colleague. Uh, a colleague from Mio Marco. I will talk from minute uh, one to minute five, and Marco will talk from minute six to minute 10. I have only five minutes. So Marco, sorry, your presentation is cut. I'm sorry, man. Um, okay, in this way, I can move the slides, I suppose. Okay, uh, the eo for you project has the main scope of, uh, let's say, creating an ecosystem to facilitate from one side, the access to a large variety of geospatial data. From the other side, the exploitation of these tools um, through, uh, let's say, uh, different types of uh, uh, processing, mainly focused on using machine learning and artificial intelligence. And the end part is related to the exploitation. So the way in which the potential users can uh, play with this uh, um, 
with this platform. Let me see if I can point out a bit. Okay, there are relevant partners. We are 19 partners, but uh, among them, uh, relevant partners in data uh, generation, among all, let's say, I would say, CNWF, relevant partner in data access. Uh, Mio probably is one of the most relevant one. And uh, well, the most relevant partner here is Systema and the exploitation very bottom here. Uh, I will have some slides, so I will try to pass one message for each of the slides that I'm going to go through. Well, I will skip uh, uh, slightly the, the different, uh, uh, let's say, uh, structure. The, the project itself is organized in tiers. So the, the, the platform itself is organized in tiers. Uh, from the data tier, uh, I want to steal the message from uh, Franz Zimler, uh, who said that, uh, uh, let's say, it's complicated, if basically impossible, to generate a, a centralized infrastructure. But instead, it is better to have a community or let's say a specific uh, tool for assessing data for a specific domain. In this case, you uh, for you has the uh, possibility to assess to, as a very decentralized way of assessing data. It implements the uh, HDA, uh, HMA process, uh, harmonized that approach uh, assess uh, like, wiki like, and assessing, let's say, Full products, but there is also the possibility through Adam to have a, a more data cube like uh, that, data assets. So, in a way that the data are, uh, let's say, ready to be used by the users. There is also the possibility to have some kind of a high level taxonomy on the data in order to facilitate the assets and the exploitation also on thematic uh, uh, topics. I think that the slide will be. Uh, distributed, so I won't, I won't spend more time on each slide. Uh, the message for the data fusion engine is there is the possibility to use high performance computing machine learning tools to do the data fusion. That means putting together different types of data, not only, let's say, regrading or homogenizing, but also really doing data fusion. And for that, um, uh, we have uh, providing a generic machine learning uh, uh, capability in order to allow different types of data fusion. Uh, let's say, and then there's the front end part. The front end has two different aspects. One is more on the data analytics, uh, let's say providing different types of visualization, but there is also the one related to the so-called marketplace. That means uh, uh, there is the possibility for users to create their own data flow and uh, to play with their own, uh, uh, let's say, uh, algorithm. Everything exploited in the platform. In this part, especially, uh, the most relevant part is related to the distribution of the computation. I give you only one, sorry. We have seven different use cases, uh, ranging from marine uh, to, let's say, food security. We have different cases on food security. And then soil erosion. And uh, the last one is uh, support, so civil protection. I will focus on this one, that is the use case uh, for the environmental pest. Unfortunately, I cannot really zoom in. Uh, here, there is more or less everything, the different pieces of the, of the platform, because the data access is assessing to data, environmental data coming from uh, satellite and the numerical modeling. Here, the data access says, I picked the data from one. Uh, I picked data from one uh, data source, that is uh, C3S. I pick some other data from satellite. I do, it's not data fusion yet. It's kind of a data homogenization, spatially and temporally. And then I have data from the FAO. And then I train a generic model. I, I train a model here to, to try, uh, let's say, uh, making the model learning how to correlate climate data and uh, locust appearance in order to do what? To do some, uh, let's say, uh, two different tiers. So the first tier is related to the, uh, let's say, uh, try to um, forecast uh, and uh, uh, using projections in order to identify the optimal environmental conditions for the appearance of locus. And the other tier instead is more related to the damage assessment. Here you have everything. You have use of EO data, you have the use of uh, numerical model and simulation and forecast, and you have, uh, uh, let's say, uh, finally, the front end, the machine learning and the front end for, for the users. Uh, just to highlight, uh, uh, this kind of approaches that can, let's say, rely on can those standardized data assets will, be will benefit also from the upcoming destiny part and other initiatives as soon as they expose some kind of uh, uh, generic uh, interfaces to assess the data. So I think that this is really uh, what we should go uh, toward. Thank you very much. Thanks for everybody for accepting the challenges of the five minutes.
Last challenge for the Harmonia project that provided a title that requires five minutes to actually be written. So I will skip it. Uh, <laughs> Julia Thort uh, three uh, uh, from the Protecnico di Milano is approaching the stairs and will give us the presentation. System for uh, improve resilience and sustain, sustainable urban areas to cope with the climate change and extreme events based on geo and advanced modeling tools. Thank you very much. <laughs> Hello, uh, good afternoon for me. Well, the last presentation, so I'm going to present Harmonia project as uh, have been presented earlier. Eiffel project is actually our sister project and um, um, I mean, I will try not to repeat some things. And as uh, as have been said, uh, we are not uh, really we were not at, the, at that moment in the European Green Deal data space, but we're using data space on this way. So uh, as uh, I'm not going to go again through the title, but as you can see, uh, we are 22 partners. And we have uh, four different pilot cities, where is Milan uh, with uh, Sofia in Bulgaria, Piraeus in Greece, and uh, Excelis in Belgium, the center of Brussels. So at the same time, we are having these four case studies. Um, so uh, Armonia is uh, really capitalizes one of uh, the wealth of existing earth observation data set and services, including data uh, Geos, Copernicus, ESA, TEM services, and other ISA data and services, as well as uh, national data cubes with uh, um, assembled modeling, socioeconomic, in situ data, and spatial and temporal scale uh, relevant for the urban environment. Um, maybe, yeah, it's also quite uh, bigger here. Yes, we can see all uh, the different data that we are collecting. Uh, just, um, uh, geotechnical data, weather data, business uh, continuity, health, and air quality. Um, uh, here we can see the different uh, hazards, and I mean uh, we are uh, we are passing through the last uh, uh, months actually. Um, urban uh, flash floodings, um, uh, soil degradation, uh, geohazard data. So we're examining in the four cities, the four places, the four different case studies, uh, this data that is a natural and man-made da uh, data and um, climate change. And we have also the um, uh, money used hazards that we're examining, that is urban heat island and uh, uh, their quality. Uh, and, uh, we can see, you can see also the different the responsible partners um, that we have also from I have here, we have uh, Ford, we have uh, NGV, um, we have Humanitas uh, Hospital is not here, but it's uh, one of that is examining also uh, the, um, uh, the main uh, data, the main uh, health data. Um, so, Armonia main objectives is to, record, to reorganize and integrate a huge amount of different data that already are available and to make the best use of the existing monitoring technologies and the spatial services for urban hazards ass uh, assessment and disaster risk management. Uh, here, we, you can see in this diagram uh, somehow how we do that data input, how we have the data preparation to bring all the data together, and uh, uh, then the intelligent framework, and uh, um, with uh, climate change mitigation, we, we are testing uh, the four case studies for the climate adaptation. So um, we are using uh, the Earth observation data. Um, that we are uh, quantified and validate them. And uh, also we are going through the risk assessment, uh, vulnerability, hazards, uh, expo exposure. And we have also a, a citizen and observation data. So in all of the cities, we are collecting data with different kind of workshops that we're organizing and, uh, and uh, collecting the data and we have a special model on that and um, we can preserve the risk and uh, risk um, indicators through that. 
and uh, we are have the integration and post project uh, updating uh, so um uh, of course uh, um I'm, I'm trying to keep uh, the five minutes. Uh, our aim is to have our IRA platform. With all of this data are, uh, are going in and are available um, on, on earlier on states. Um, so uh, here is uh, our contact. Uh, you can, we had also earlier our, our poster. There is a bit, little video that you can follow us here and all our um, social media that uh, you can uh, find us in. Uh, thank you very much. You are, what is that yours? Oops, thank you. <laughs> all right, so uh, it was uh, relatively on time uh, for almost every presenter. I really uh, thank you for being in the five minutes, however, there has been some small delay. We had a discussion prepared that will definitely not happen. Instead, you have been quietly waiting for your moment for one hour and 25 minutes, and you deserve the opportunity. So, please, you have your four minutes of glory. Uh, I'm opening uh, some questioning slash discussion on how this beast about the, the data spaces in general and the Green Deal data space in particular could be contributed to the Euro Geos or the Geo in general. Who wants to say something? But we have the first intervention there. And we have a mic. Thank you very much. I'm new to Eurogeo, I'm an ecologist. I've been listening to this for two days. It's fascinating. I am utterly boggled by what is out there. Is there any way of making a list that says all of this is there because they're all individual projects. You have to know they're there. It's extremely difficult to know what to look for. Is there anywhere, I mean, even something as simple as Cordis, which nobody ever uses, of course, that says, here is a list of all the databases and all the data cubes that are in preparation and here literally so that you can have some sort of idea of what's out there because it's increasing like topsy and we're all losing track yeah and if there isn't a list should there be from the point of view of euro geos i believe there isn't from the point of view of geo of course it is we have uh, two different things we have the infrastructure with the geo portal where you can well, look for data. We have the yellow pages that will tell you who are the contributors to, to, to the geo in terms of data. But there is also the working groups. There is a structure of working groups that you can visit in the, in the geo website where you will see different communities working towards uh, different objectives. And uh, I mean, they, there are four or five types of communities, but I will save that to you. <laughs> Yeah. No. Yes. Uh, a list of who's doing what. Thank you. Um, this is the scope of uh, Eurogeo. We are uh, preparing. Uh, we are preparing the project Eurogeosec that is under negotiation with the Commission. So what this one of the scope is to map all stakeholders. We are working, uh, we and uh, ERSC, uh, we as, as uh, CNR, we are working to map all these initiatives. As you said, we have project, uh, we have uh, different initiative, action group, but we don't know how uh, they are putting their information. Oh, right, we, we know, but they are scattered. So one of the main scope is to map of all this and to put everything on one page, for example. That is your, I, I think. My as part as a kickoff for an ESA project called uh, EO for Health, I think. 
or something like that. Um, you know, to, to look at a, a project that's been funded to set up a, a access to Earth observation data produced by ESA, which is the producer, obviously, for health. I've heard of seven or eight such initiatives here. Why doesn't ESA know about them? I'm not criticizing ESA, but, you know, a lot of it's been done already, and it just means that if we don't know, we get duplication. Yeah, uh, no, it's not a reply to, to that. I have another question <laughs> to the audience, and maybe this is a really provocative one. Um, it's the second year I'm attending the Eurogeo workshop, and the second year we hear about data spaces, and I have the feeling that's a kind of rebranding of the SDI concept, because when I see uh, the presentation for, from France, when I hear about fragmented landscape of EO in Europe, this is something we know for more than 20, 25 years. And, uh, and I really have the feeling that we are talking about exactly the same thing for ages. And do we have learned something from that? And what are the key differences between an SDI and a data space? I like your question, and I sympathize with the, with, with the idea, actually. The fundamentals are there. So, in short, I really believe that the data space is, uh, in essence, uh, uh, SDI as you presented. But I believe the, the, the Commission gives us this opportunity to actually broaden the space, uh, to include IoT data. Uh, that was missing in the in the special data infrastructure, particularly in Inspire, uh, the inclusion of citizen science, the inclusion uh, of the processing capacities that inspired the European SDA also lacked. Uh, I believe this is the intention, and this is why the concept of data space was thrown to us. If the second thing is about the, the digital economy and so on, and now we are trying to figure out how to really apply that. No, and uh, maybe you could. Yeah? I agree, and I would like to add one important aspect that particularly the Euro European context has changed very much since the release of the European strategy for data, in particular concerning the different regulations. So one specific aspect uh, that differentiate data spaces from SDIs is the fo this focus on trust, which means not just data sharing, but trust data sharing, which means uh, including the security and trust systems to actually uh, support what is called the European way, which means uh, to protect the data privacy and in general data sovereignty. So for example, as a consequence of the European strategy for data, several regulations were released, the Data Act, the Data Governance Act, and so on and so on. So this is uh, actually quite a game changer for the the European context. Uh, I would like to, to, to invite uh, Pente for the last intervention, but you were so eager that I will allow that. <laughs> okay, I, as, as some, most of you know, I'm a former director of the GEO Secretariat. And I think that let's, if, you, if we look at the long run, the contribution of Europe to GEO and GEOS has been very positive and largely appreciated by the global community. And that contribution takes many forms. Uh, of course, the most direct form is the Copernicus program, the satellites, which are absolutely uh, the best uh, contribution on Earth observation anywhere. And I, um, I think we should not put too much emphasis on specific gathering together. When I see, I've been to Euro, many Euro geos, and I see something positive which adds up step by step. Sometimes we're too eager for things to happen tomorrow, but in this game, what is most important is in the long run. So I, I would argue from perspective of someone who has been here for in geo for day zero, that you should be proud of the contribution you're doing. We should value the diversity of uh, scholarship and efforts that has been shown today, yesterday, and in the other EUROGUs. And 
Of course, the Commission is to be supported by keeping this, this group uh, alive and fresh with work. So I think we should not over push. Oh, we need to put together things together immediately. I think in the long run, there is something tangible that no other group, and I'm afraid to say so, no other group in the world is even close to what UG was doing. So my word is of congratulations to you all, and you should be proud of what you're doing. All right. So, so thank you very much. I, uh, be, coming from you, I was not expecting that. Uh, I was expecting kind of a, you know, challenge, but uh, so I appreciate that doubly. Uh, <laughs> and uh, yeah, I mean, I'm, yeah. I'm fine. I mean, I don't drink coffee. So, so if you want to continue, I will allow that for five minutes. Uh, uh, maybe it's my turn now. <laughs> yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Let's do that. And uh, then, the, the, then you know, there is the my my coordinator in uh, uh, yeah, EO. Yeah. For, uh, you know, I I have some things to do also. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So. Uh, um... So, Gilberto, I, uh, yeah, I appreciate what you say, and I, I agree. Um, being a part of the GEO family since 2004, 2004, so many years. Um, I, would, I would like to do a comment on the GEOS, the Global Earth Observation System of Systems. Uh, it is actually, a, the idea was, or was and still is, to create a federated system of systems not to compete with the members of organizations or um, administrations, etc., from the member countries and participating organization. The concept is still valid, and I think that the data spaces can fit very well. I'm not, I, I think we have come to the conclusion that uh, having a diversity of data sets and information or observations, including in situ, I think this is, uh, there is no need to defragmatize. I mean, we can, we can use interoperability standards, et cetera, et cetera, to fix that. And I think that was actually the original idea, still valid. I, and then with that, I also would like to express a little bit of concern with respect to the term earth intelligence, because that uh, it's probably too late, but I, don't, I want to be also doing like Giuliani and <laughs> say something maybe not so popular. Uh, I fear that when we are talking about Earth intelligence, we are going to be more competitive. I mean, we EuroGeo or Geo, competitive with, again, the members. Geo's unique position, and thus also EuroGeo's position in the global ecosystem of all organizations, is that we are addressing Earth observations and everything related to making that interoperable and usable. And that was what was missing, and that is why I think we have succeeded in maintaining these communities. If we, and I remember since I mentioned I was part of the, the community since 2004, so I have a, some memory. <laughs> and, and I remember we were discussing, we have to create something that doesn't compete with the members. And I fear that this is, we have to pay attention to that. Mm -hmm. And I think the data spaces now can maybe help us to go back or focus on that part to make the data interoperable, to focus on everything related to Earth observations data. Yeah. Thank you. What about that? We had a word there and we finalized with, with uh, the organizers. Uh, yes? Well, uh, there's a lot to, to say about Earth intelligence and data space. Perhaps one of the objective we failed in the last uh, 15 years is to provide trusted, reliable data set on which we can base policy assessment. So in the way I see it, that the data space now should select high quality data among in the landscape of a huge amount of data sets that can be used in trusted way. That's why health intelligence is not anymore to collect data, is to make sure that the data are of high quality Otherwise, you cannot use the data to do policy evaluation mm -hmm. because data should follow a strict 
quality assurance policy in order to be trustable for doing a socioeconomic scenario policy analysis that government can buy in. Otherwise, it will become a tool that you will use for research purposes, that's it. So the difference between now and the past that the data space should have the capacities to select high quality data, trustable, that can be used for further application to support the policy decision-making process. That is gonna be difficult. And if I may, I haven't seen any data selector in any of the presentations that I've seen so far. So I believe that's a very valuable- Well, let uh, me add comment. one more point. All European directive, as an example, every European directive for air quality, water quality, yeah, 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 yeah. they have uh, next about how to do data quality on monitoring data. Yes. So that is what should be considered as a standard, not what uh, people in the room may like. For example, we should talk about citizen science IoT data. I can tell you that all these data are almost useless for policy evaluation because no government will buy in evaluation done with this data, only with this data, unless you provide a QAQC analysis very rigorous one mm -hmm. that can prove that your data are robust, uh, re uh, reproducible, and so on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a, that's a fair point too. I could, as an as an expert on citizen science, I could reply, but I, I'm the moderator, so I cannot do that. Go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I would just like to go back to uh, uh, William. He's the first time at Eurogeo. And yes. he gives you this uh, basically uh, uh, honest, I mean, uh, genuine advice. Absolutely. And I recognize it. It will be very useful for Eurogeo, which is like a family of these European projects, uh, to have a place where there's an inventory of the projects, of the data sets, of the tools built, of the use cases, pilots. You know, it will be extremely, I think, useful to have that at one place, including previous Eurogeo uh, conferences and workshops, you know. So, yeah. uh, so I I don't know who's in charge of Eurogeo, but <laughs> message. I think France probably. The well, message is uh, uh, yes. I believe. Ah, yeah, Sorry. So the message is yeah. But we, I, I believe we could we could yeah. generate the content. You know, yeah, we just yeah, need yeah. some place where we can. I believe yeah, there will just, be. Yeah. You tell us like which which is the data set you make, which are your you know uh, partners and everything and. So I, we could provide the content. I believe we, there will be changes on how Erosios is going to be managed in the future. So that's valuable insight, absolutely, on how this management body could actually uh, provide an extra service to the membership. I can answer. I think that's very, very good points. And, and um, that brings us to the discussion of tomorrow where we will discuss about what can Eurogeo do and what can the Eurogeo secretariat do, what can the action groups do. And I think uh, that's, that's, that's what we should think about and then also put in practice to really, I think one thing, and I like your comments or both comments, what came out is really amazing what, what is being done and there's so many, so many things, but we lack a bit the visibility. It's not, we don't, <laughs> We sit here and show it to each other, but the world out there, they don't know about it really. And that re is something we really need to need to work on to make it much more visible it to the rest of the world. All right. And with, uh, and with that, I would like to, to say that this was organized by the Action Group on the Green Deal Data Space. This is one of the European Action Groups into the Eurogeo. If you want to be part, please email me or, or, or Paolo, and we will add it, uh, you to the, to the mailing list. There will be another session on the Green Deal Data Space on Thursday. This is not the Eurogeo program. This is the other uh, parallel program that starts on Wednesday afternoon, and Tom told you before. Uh, and uh, one of these other tools that we are speculating is, is uh, a tool to also collect requirements from people. If you are not able to find your project or your data set, uh, maybe you could store your requirements for, for, extra, for an extra look uh, afterwards. Uh, uh, what I'm missing, uh, nothing else? 
So thank you for being here. And we will try hard to work in between uh, meetings. But for sure, we will have an, an action group uh, meeting next year. I look forward to that. Thanks.